Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to Sue Generis. My name is Isaac Christopher Lubogo. We're going to discuss very interesting subjects here that got to do with what is happening in the nation, the predicament of Uganda today. How do you understand the political what landscape as we know it today? And I chose to call this Twa uh, Kutege de Conspiracies and Myths, a philosophical odyssey through the libraneth of corridors of Ugandan political power. And uh, I'll begin by imploring us to understand and comprehend uh, this disclaimer. And this is intended for you to understand that I'm not targeting any particular individual, but I'm just causing us to think out of the box and throw that box away. Listen, my friends, the poisoning uh, discourse is simply a scholarly exploration delving into the intricate interplay of what they call political dynamics within the context of Uganda. Not so. And therefore, it is imperative to underscore the intention behind this analysis, and that this analysis is purely academic, philosophical, and it's aimed at fostering what they call intellectual inquiry and critical reflection. So please understand it under the context under which we are discussing this. And in the spirit of intellectual curiosity and academic rigor, the perspectives of, uh, you know, that I'm going to discuss are presented with an intention to provoke thought, and to stimulate dialogue rather than espouse any particular agenda or ideology. And it is intended for, uh, for the purposes of uh, you know, opening up our minds and our willingness to engage in what they call constructive discourse, transcending a conversion of boundaries and embracing the ethos of uh, intellectual inquiry. So even as we be begin to underscore and debate some of these things, please op open your minds and be uh, uh, you know, excited so as a renowned philosopher Socrates amply remarked that wisdom begins in wonder, therefore let us embark on this intellectual journey with a sense of wonder and curiosity, challenging assumptions, questioning conversions, and exploring the depth of human thought with fearless introspection. And at the end of the day, the views expressed in this discourse are offered as a contribution to an ongoing dialogue surrounding political governance and social dynamics and they do not purport to offer definite solutions or prescriptive directives but rather to seek to illuminate the complexities of the human condition and inspire a deep understanding of the world in which we live. Please understand that from the word go. So as I embark on this intellectual odyssey with humility, curiosity and a commitment to the pursuit of truth guided by the timeless words of Aristotle Aristotle one time said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. I'll say that again. It is a mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. So, please understand, as we engage in these political discourses or political ideology, one thing we must comprehend is that political ideology serve as an ethanol scaffold upon which societies construct their collective understanding on social order and progress. And it is uh, invisible, it's what they call the invisible hand that shapes the narrative of communal existence, uh, wavering intricate patterns of norms and values that dictate societal evolution. So much like the intricate dance of molecules within a biological organism, ideologies choreograph the movement of human interactions, guiding communities towards a cohesion and chaos, on the other hand. So in essence, an ideology is a subtle melody orchestrating the symphony of what they call human endeavor, harmonizing uh, you know, the disparate voices of individuals into a coercive chorus of shared purpose. So without this ideology compass, societies risk drifting aimlessly upon the turbulent sea of history, susceptible to the whelms of fate and the caprices of circumstances. Yet like the delicate balance of a biological ecosystem, ideologies must adapt to an ever-changing landscape of human experience, just as a body's metabolism must contend with external toxins to maintain equilibrium. So ideologies must confront the challenges of a dynamic world to remain relevant and resilient. Failure to do so invites the specter of obsolescence. An outdated ideology succumbs to what they call inexorable march of progress. So, please understand, therefore, in this debate, 
the vitality or the vitality in terms of the ideology lies not in its rigidity but in its capacity for introspection and adaption. So it is through this continual process of renewal that ideologies transcend the ephemeral constraints of time and circumstances, enduring as a guiding beacon amidst the tumult of human affairs. Once again, my name is Isaac Christopher Lubogo. Welcome to Sue Generis and also welcome to Lubogo.org where we demystify the law and add your philosophical dispensations in terms of opening our minds to think outside the box but also to throw the box away. I'm going to discuss what we call the shadow maneuvers and unraveling the political future of Uganda. Please understand that this again is intended for intellectual uh, argument and debate. In the intricate tapestry of our human governance, Uganda stands at a canvas upon which the paradoxes of power and the complicities of authority are vividly painted. That is something we must comprehend. So amidst the pulsating rhythms of political discourse and the solemn symphony of societal aspiration, one finds a recurring motif, the enigmatic word twa kuteged de. The argument here is twa kuteged de. Translated literally meaning we shall, we have understood you, okay? Its resonance extends far beyond its linguistic confines, embodying both promise of guidance and the specter of manipulation. Please understand that. As I said, this is intended for philosophical debate. Now, in the short, you know, in the corridors of power, Traku de Gede emerges as a symbol of perennial struggle between rulers and the rule, between the ostensible guardians of the polity and those who navigate its turbulent waters. So its utterance invokes a potent blend of irony and profundity, escapulating the tension between democratic ideas and authoritarian realities. So between the rhetoric of representation and the machinery of control. Yet within the crucible of Ugandan politics, Twakutegede assumes a multifaceted guise, serving as both rallying cry for collective action and a somber reminder of the precarious balance between freedom and oppression. Its resonance echoes through the annals of history, tracing the contours of power dynamics and engaging in those things that have shaped our nation's destiny. So, my friend, I'll be drawing upon the rich tapestry by inferring in terms of philosophical thought from much of various treatises on the art of governance to Foucault's exploration of power dynamics. I will embark on a journey in terms of intellectual inquiry into the heart of Uganda's political liberty. And that is something you must understand again from the word go. And the argument here is that through the prisms of Tuakutege Day, we will unveil the threads of conspiracy and intrigue that wave together the fabric of Ugandan politics, probing the depth of human ambition and the limits of societal resiliency. Welcome once again. My name is Isaac Christopher Lubogo. We're just beginning to unveil the argument of Tuakutege Day in the line of the political dimensions of Uganda's politics as we understand it today. So in the Librinate corridors of power, where shadows dance with the ghosts of history and whispers of dissent mingle with the calm of authority, Tuakutege Day stands as a testament to the enduring struggle of liberation and the perennial quest for justice. Its irony serves as a mirror reflecting the complexities of human nature while its symbolism resonates with the echoes of a nation's aspirations. So, as we navigate this treacherous current of Uganda's political landscape, I'll be guided by the enigmatic mantra of Tuakutege Kutegede, and I will embark on a journey, as I said, of intellectual exploration and philosophical reflection, seeking to unravel the mysteries that lie at the intersection of the power and humanity. And I'm gonna lay bare some of the things, some of the conspiracies that may be what? Itching in the minds of people today as we understand the political landscape of Uganda. The question is that as the political landscape of Uganda evolves, it becomes a web of intrigue and cultivated maneuvers, emerging and hinting at a future shaped by perhaps clandestine agendas and strategic plays. Beneath the surface lies a tapestry of actions, each thread woven into a narrative of ambition, dynasty, and control. And this is something that we must comprehend from the word go. Get excited, my friend. I'm beginning to point them down. Number one, even as we argue this idea of Clark Day, I would like to comprehend the idea of hypocrisy of power. 
The incumbent, His Excellency, ascended to power was marked by a rhetoric saying, serving long serving leaders are a problem. Yet, in spite of that, he embodies the very phenomenon he actually denounced. Okay? Tightening his grip on the authority over the many years. Mm -hmm. We are proceeding. Number two, his argument from a single party dominance to dynastic designs, transitioning from a single party system to a multi party framework, seemed as a gesture towards democracy. Yet it also involved a facade behind which the ruling elite entrenched their influence. Mm -hmm. We go to number three. Number three, we could also argue that eroding uh, democratic safeguards, the removal, for example, of term you know, limits and age limits, consolidated power within the ruling circle, shielding them from the threat of electoral accountability and, and paving a way for what they call seamless transition within the ruling family. Are we together? We are laying bare the things, as I said, this is an intellectual debate. Please bear with us and comprehend as an intellectual debate. Number four, the rise of hair apparent. The accelerated rise of his son, for example, through military acts, in spite of the credence that the, 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 the honorable gentleman holds, coupled by his over forays into politics, signals a carefully crafted succession plan where familiar ties supersede institutional norms. Mm -hmm. When you go to number five, uh, we could also add in terms of what they call strangling dissent, a dissent within the ruling party or the military is sometimes suffocated through combination of coercion or co-option in terms of the marginalized and also ensuring an unified comfort in the support of the dynastic agenda. That is something, again, we must comprehend in this, in this ideology. And then if you add you as point number six, as a political prodigy in the making, the present son emerges as a political force in his own right, yeah? Leveraging executive authority and public visibility to lay ground for a future bid for power, either within or outside the ruling party structure. That is something you cannot hold away again. Let me go to point number seven. In terms of the machinations of succession, for example, when you argue in terms of anticipating resistance from entrenched lawyers, the president in Guinea has a scenario where his son obviously becomes the face of the new opposition force. Not so through the PLU, yeah? Positioning himself as a credible alternative to the ruling establishment. We may not blame him if he's the better groom. Not so. That is something, again, we may comprehend as well in terms of intellectual argument. We could also add your point number eight, as a calculated chess game, for example, strategic reappointments within the military hierarchy that serve to consolidate the president's grip, son's grip on power, preempting any potential challenges from within the ranks. By, for example, now putting him in that privileged position of commander, absolute commander, in terms of the army. Not so. You could also add in terms of uh, the legacy of the dynasty, yeah, as point number nine. In terms of orchestrating this intricate dance of power, the incumbent president seeks to ensure a seeming transition of authority, uh, you know, to his progeny, uh, perpetuating what they call a dynasty of legacy, while maintaining uh, a veneer of democratic uh, legacy or legitimacy for that purpose. So the argument here I'm trying to propose, my friends, that in this speculative narrative, the future of Uganda hangs in balance, not so. Teetering uh, between a smooth dynastic uh, succession uh, in terms of an odious uh, coup, perhaps, that is likely to be orchestrated from within the ruling party or within the ruling family, or a, a systematic shift in the political landscape with the emergence of formidable position led by the president's own flesh and blood. That is something you must comprehend again from the word go. So as the chess pieces are moved with precision, the fate of the nation lies in the hands of those who wield power behind the curtain. That is something that you must comprehend again from the word go. Okay, I'm going deeper. And please comprehend as we try to demystify the, this confidence of philosophical uh, jurisprudence for you. Let me delve deeper into each of these uh, issues, uh, weaving them into a fabric of our own speculative narrative. And uh, I'll argue, for example, in terms of the hypocrisy of power, so that you comp can comprehend from a presidential point of view what we are talking about. Listen. The president's initial condemnation of long-serving leaders sets the stage for his own paradoxical reign. Not so. Where promises of reform give way to entrenched authority and manipulation of democratic processes. Remember that? He said Africa's biggest problem is those leaders who overstay in power. Now we see something different. Not so. Let's argue point number two. If we argue in terms of single party dominance, that you know, occurred for a long time. Yeah, single party dominance in terms of uh, a dynastic design. Yeah, this transition from single party system to multi party politics appeared as a concession to democratic ideals. But beneath its surface, 
he serves as a tool for consolidating power within the ruling family in a circle. And that is something that you may comprehend. Because how many have we seen over and over in spite of the different elections that we had? We've seen one particular superman who has already exceeded others. Not so. Let's argue point number three in terms of the eroding democratic safeguards. And these are paramount and essential. Removing term and age limits creates a political landscape devoid of checks and balances, allowing the ruling elite to entrench themselves further and pave the way for a dynastic, a dynamic, uh, a dynastic kind of succession. And that is something, again, you, must, you can't hide away. I'm arguing in terms of intellectualism and in terms of jurisprudence. Let's argue in terms of the rise of a, the so-called heir apparent. The rapid accession of the present son through military ranks, in spite of the fact that this gentleman is highly uh, educated in terms of military maneuvers, uh, you know, a graduate of uh, wonderful schools, you know, his overt political ambitions reveal a meticulously orchestrated plan for familiar succession within the military prowess and therefore becomes a vehicle for political dominance. And no doubt that we have seen him, in spite of the fact that he's been a serving officer, that he has been eminently engaged in political, uh, you know what, dialogues in terms of, uh, with the public. If you could do, in terms of uh, uh, what they call strangling dissent, a dissent within the ruling party or the military is systematically suppressed, ensuring, you know, unfilled front in support of the dynastic agenda, as potential rivals are actually neutralized through coercion or co-option. How many times do we see all these guys who are within the same ranks with uh, the guy when they went to the bush? Many of them are retired and none of them are in the office anymore. If you are to add in terms of political prodigy, in terms of the making, the president's son emerges as a charismatic figure, not so leveraging his position to cultivate a political persona and lay the groundwork for future bid of power, blurring the lines between military and political authority. And that is something, again, you cannot deny from the word go. If you are to add in terms of the machinations of succession, for example, anticipating resiliency, for example, or resistance from within the ruling party, there are, ch there are those who may not believe in, you know, that ascension of power of his son. But the president engineers a scenario where his son becomes the face of the new opposition force, positioning himself as a credible alternative to the ruling establishment. And I'm not saying that there's everything wrong about it. I'm just telling you the ideology and the philosophical arguments that come with what is happening. And that's why I'm aching the argument of Fawah Kutegede in terms of that conception. Now, if you argue in terms of a calculated chess game again, strategic reappointment, for example, within the military hierarchy to serve consolidating the present grip on power, making him the overall, he's saying now it's simply a stamp, perhaps, an approval, perhaps, or perhaps an indication that, you know what, this is the way to go. You have now made ground, you have now become popular, and now you feel we are able to move on in that direction. How about if you had argued in terms of the legacy of a dynasty? Yeah? Through these intricate maneuvers, the incumbent, uh, you know, basically seeks to cement a, a dynastic legacy, ensuring a seamless, you know, a seamless transfer of authority from his progeny while maintaining a facade of democratic governance. And, and these are super questionable, uh, you know, intellectual debates that you and I have to engage in our minds. And that's why I'm arguing in terms of trap to get there. So in this speculative narrative, each action taken by the ruling elite serves to reinforce the grip on power and shape the trajectory of Uganda's political future blurring the lines between democracy and dynastic, dynastic rule. So as the stage is set for a pivotal moment in terms of the nation's history, the true extent of these shadowy maneuvers begins to unravel, revealing landscape shaped by ambition, deception, and the ruthless pursuit to power. So I'll develop a little bit deeper in terms of the practical examples and explore the potential outcomes of some of these issues that have to do with the ideology of Fuaku Day in terms of comprehending what we, we know today. If you add in terms of hypocrisy of power, the president's initial condemnation of long-serving leaders is exemplified by his statement upon assuming office. This rhetoric resonates with populism, not so, uh, garnering widespread support, not so. However, as years pass, the president gradually consolidates power, citing stability and uh, national interest as justification for his prolonged tenure. We cannot argue against that. What is the possible outcome of that? The possible outcome of this could be the populace becomes disillusioned with the president's hypocrisy, leading to widespread unrest and calls for change. However, the entrenched ruling allies deploy security forces sometimes to suppress dissent, maintaining their own grip on power. And that is something that may be hypothetically understood or even urged. Please understand that I'm urging this president and um, being, uh, you know, uh, legal and at the same time jurisprudential in terms of contemplation of these ideas. Now, let's explore the argument in terms of single party dominance to a dynastic uh, design. Uh, the, the transition from single party dominance to multi-party politics ostensibly signals the move towards democracy. Not so. However, behind the scenes, 
the ruling party remains uh, to having control over key institutions, ensuring the opposition uh, parties remain marginalized. And what is the possible outcome in terms of such a debate? So the argument here is that while opposition parties exist normally, or, or normally for that purpose, they lack the resources and the institutional support to challenge the ruling party effectively. So elections are you know, sometimes marred by irregularities, and further commenting on, on, on the ruling elite grip on power is something that you and I can comprehend and understand even without further ado. Not so. If you are to argue in terms of uh, the eroding democratic safeguards, and this is super, super important, because the removal of term and age limits is framed as a necessary uh, argument in terms of stability and continuity. However, it effectively consolidates power within the ruling family as the present position and his son as their higher apparent. And that is something, again, that questions uh, you know, the issues. And if you had to argue that in terms of a possible outcome, what happens that with no term or even age limit, the president remains in power indefinitely, uh, paving a way for you know seemingly transform of authority to his son? Not so. And therefore, the problem is that the, the, the debate becomes that the opposition voices are usually silenced and dissent is met with uh, repression. And that becomes another question in terms of a debate. Please understand that this is jurisprudence, as I said, and this is intellectualism, which has having an intellectual debate. And this is a question of thinking outside the box and throwing the box away. It's not intended to cause any arousal or any appeasal in any way. So the argument here also, if you add in terms of the rise of hair apparent, the president's son, in terms of the rapid, uh, you know, through military ranks and accompanied by a carefully orchestrated media campaign highlighting his leadership and qualities and commitment to national service is another aspect. And we're not, we cannot, we're not ruling that away. The word of God says, give honor where it is due. We are not ruling away that these are superheroes in their own right. But we are saying that the dangers of some of these things, ideologically, philosophically, these are the things that we are debating. In terms of possible outcome, the present son becomes a prominent figure in Ugandan politics, positioning himself as a viable successor to his father. His military background, obviously, lends him a lot of credibility while his public appearances solidify his support base. And that is something that you must comprehend again from the word go. And that's why I'm coming with this ideology of track to get there. If you're arguing in terms of struggling dissent again, dissent within the ruling party or military is quashed through a combination of intimidation perhaps, sometimes bribery and sometimes corruption. So those who speak out against the regime are sidelined or face sometimes you go your persecution. And that is something that you have to be careful even as an argument. In terms of an outcome, the ruling element uh, or the ruling allied for this purpose maintain a facade of unity, presenting a unified front to the public. So meanwhile, dissent uh, simmers beneath the surface with dissenting voices uh, uh, marginalized and even silenced where it had, they have to be. Not so. Now, let's argue in terms of uh, the argument of, of political product in, in the making. The president's son obviously leverages, as I said, his uh, military position to gain political influence. No doubt he's a superhero in terms of that component. We can all bear witness to that. But the argument here is that he, ideologically he's positioning himself as a key player in terms of the ruling party's inner circle, yeah? And public appearances and media campaigns portray him as a visionary leader with a broader appeal. No doubt we have seen him uh, pull off super deals in the context of, uh, uh, of, of good vision for the country. And we cannot take that away from him. We are arguing intellectualism, jurisprudence, in the argument of track integrity. In terms of possible outcomes, the President Sam definitely garners widespread support within the ruling party and among the general population, positioning himself as, a, as what? As a natural successor to his father. And the opposition voices are systematically marginalized, leaving little room for dissent. In fact, if there's any opposition, it actually is co-opted or swings over to his side. And therefore, you find only two superpowers in terms of the political dilemma of this country. Now, if you are to argue in terms of the machinations of succession, anticipating resistance from within the ruling party, because there are those who say, no, we're not going to accept. The president engineers a scenario where his son establishes a new political movement by the names of uh, PLU, not so, positioning himself as a viable alternative to any ruling establishment. So with or without NRM, there's a possibility that this individual is able to proceed. Not so. If you are to add in terms of possible outcome, the president's son's political movement gains traction, attracting disaffected members of the ruling party and even opposition supporters. Yeah, those who have been disillusioned with the status quo. Not so. So as the president's popularity wins, his son emerges as formidable what? Challenger. 
And that's why sometimes we look, we look at him in that argument in the book that he wrote, The Avengers Ethos, in terms of Mahoseology and the kind of Garazi. Remember the debate that we had. Now, in terms of uh, the argument, in terms of cultural chess game, I would also want to argue and say strategic reappointments within the military, like he has, his excellence has done in terms of military hierarchy, ensure reality within the ring family agenda. Potential rivals obviously are sidelined and forced to retire, not so, leaving the present son as the undisputed leader of the armed forces. And obviously, this is creating very solid ground for the young gentleman. Not so. In terms of the possible outcome, the problem is going to be that the military remains a key pillar in terms of support for the ruling family, ensuring that any attempts to challenge the authority are swiftly crushed. Not so. And the present son obviously consolidates his grip on power, positioning himself as the de facto ruler in, of Uganda. And I can assure you that even as we speak, that is a likelihood in terms of the debate that you may have today. Theoretically, hypothetically, jurisprudentially, philosophically. That is something that you could debate. If you are to argue in terms of the legacy of the dynasty, through these intricate maneuvers, the ruling family uh, secures its grip on power, ensuring a seamless transition of authority from father to son. So opposition voices are actually marginalized, and dissent is made sometimes with repression. And the possible outcome of this is that the ruling family dynasty is actually cemented for generations to come, with the present son inheriting the mantle of leadership. Uh, while the facade of democracy may remain, real power lies in the hands of the ruling elite who govern it sometimes with impunity or with a lot of bias if you don't, if, if, if it's left unchecked. And it's something that you must understand again from the word go. Now, I would like to make uh, a philosophical justification that could actually underpin such action, drawing from insights from renowned philosophers who have actually examined the dynamics of power and governance. And that's the argument that I'm proponing here. I'm arguing jurisprudence and I'm not making a proposal, a, a what? We, I'm not sounding an alarm for any particular individual. This is jurisprudence in terms of comprehending the intellectualism that comes with the political ideology. If you are to argue uh, Machiavellian uh, real politic, yeah, Machiavellian real politic, the actions of the ruling elite may find philosophical grounding in Machiavelli's writing, particularly in uh, the so-called The Prince. Machiavelli advocates for the pragmatic exercise of power, emphasizing the importance of maintaining control, stability through any means necessary, by any means necessary. Remember, my friend, what, Malcolm X, uh, Malcolm K. Lito, he used to say, by all means necessary. Not so. Those are the arguments I'm proponing. I'll give you a quote in respect to that with uh, Machiavelli. Machiavelli says, it's better to be feared than loved if you cannot be both. That's what's said by Niccolo Machiavelli. It's better to be feared than loved. If you cannot, then be both. Mm -hmm. In terms of explanation, the ruling elite ruthless pursuit of power, including the suppression of dissent and manipulation of democratic processes, reflects Machiavelli's pragmatic approach of governance, prioritizing stability and control uh, over ethical considerations. And that's something you must comprehend again as we debate this particular interesting subject of power protected day. If you are to argue in terms of what they call the Hengelian dialectics, Hengelian from the guy Hengel, uh, Hengel's dialectical method may actually offer insights into the ruling elite's action, particularly in his concept of master-slave dialectics. Yeah? So according to Hengel, individuals and societies seek recognition and dominance over others, leading to power struggles and hierarchical structures. Yeah? And I'm going to give you a quote by your friend uh, 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 William uh, Hengel. Uh, uh, Hengel said the history of the world is none other than the progress of consciousness of freedom. He says the history of the world is none other than the progress of the consciousness of freedom. That was said by George Willem Friedrich Hengel. And in terms of underscoring what this may particularly mean today is that the ruling elite consideration of power and suppression of dissent can actually be understood as manifestations of the struggle for recognition and dominance as they seek to maintain their position at the apex of societal hierarchy. This is something you cannot run away from. Yeah, I'm going to give you another philosopher in terms of uh, a guy called Faudilian. Uh, we, we argued in terms of uh, Foucault. Foucault, how do you rather call the Faudilian power dynamics? Foucault, how do you rather call the Foucauldian uh, power dynamics? And Foucault's analysis of power is a pervasive and uh, disciplinary force offers a framework of understanding the ruling elite control mechanism, particularly in the concept of, uh, uh, you know, biopower. According to Foucault, power operates not only through coercion, but also through regulation and control of bodies and populations. Yeah? And I'll give you a quote by your guy, Michael Foucault. Michael Foucault said, 
Uh, the power is everything, not because it embraces everything, but because it comes from everywhere. That's what your guy, Michael Fuckle, said. He said, power is everywhere, not because it embraces everything, but because it comes from everywhere. That's what Michael Fuckle said. Now, by way of explanation, you can't say the ruling elite, in terms of manipulation of democratic institution, suppressions of dissent, and control over the military, exemplify Foucault's concentration of the power uh, as diffuse and also omnipresent, operating at both institutional and even individual levels. And that is something that you must, cannot take away again. I'll also argue another uh, philosopher, your guy, the Marxist, yeah? Marxist analysis of class struggle. Marxist philosophy provides a lens through which to intersect the ruling, you know, elite actions as manifestations of class struggle and the perpetuation of what they call BJZ hegemony. So according to, to Karl Marx, the ruling class maintains its dominance through control over the means of production and ideological institutions. And I'm gonna give you a quote in terms of your guy Karl Marx. Karl Marx said the idea or the ideas of the ruling class are the very epoch of ruling ideas. Remember that, the ideas of the ruling class are the very epoch of the ruling ideas. That was said by Karl Marx. So the ideas of the ruling class are the very epoch of the ruling ideas. That was said by your guy, Karl Marx. In terms of financial, you could argue and say the ruling elites, manipulation of political institutions, suppression of dissent, for example, and the promotion of dynastic what, succession can actually be understood as a struggle to perpetuate their class interests and maintain their grip on power. Please understand that again from the word go. Yeah? Now listen. The argument that I'm proponing here is that these uh, philosophical justifications for the ruling elite's actions draw upon a range of perspectives, uh, from Machiavellian pragmatism to Hegelian dialectics, uh, and also Fordian power dynamics, and then Marxist analysis in terms of class struggle. So each provides insights into the dynamics of power and governance, and each sheds light on the what the motivations and the consequences of the ruling elite's actions. And that is something, again, you cannot take away in terms of the debate that we're having today. Please understand as a, that this is intended for intellectual argument so that you can have a rendezvous with uh, jurisprudence and, uh, and, what? And, 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 and philosophy of thought. Let me continue in terms of relating to some philosophical perspectives in terms of Uganda's predicament. What are, some, what are the possible uh, philosophical perspectives as far as Uganda's predicament is concerned? If you are to argue uh, Machiavellian uh, real politic in terms of Uganda, the ruling elite in Uganda may justify their actions by adapting a Machiavellian approach of governance, emphasizing the pragmatic exercise of power to maintain stability and control. Yeah? And that's something you must understand. And therefore, by suppressing dissent and manipulating democratic processes, they actually prioritize the, you know, the preservation of their own authority over ethical considerations. So this aligns with uh, Machiavelli's assertion that it is better to be uh, feared than loved if one cannot be both. Not so. So reflecting the ruling elite's reliance on coercion and intimidation to maintain power. And that is something, <clears throat> again, that we cannot take away from this debate. Now, if you are to argue in terms of uh, Hegelian dialectics in terms of Uganda, we could argue and say Hegel's concept of uh, the master-slave dialectic offer insights into Uganda's power dynamics, yeah? So where the ruling elites seek what they call recognition and the dominance over the populace. So by consolidating, you know, power within their own ranks, and suppressing any kind of dissent. They actually perpetuate what they call hierarchical and societal structures in which they occupy the position of master while the populace uh, is actually renegated uh, to the status of slaves, not so. And this struggle for recognition and dominance shapes Uganda's political landscape uh, with the ruling elite uh, seeking to maintain uh, their you know, position at the apex of societal hierarchy. And that is something, again, we cannot take away from this wonderful debate. The argument of could take it there. Now, if you are to add in terms of uh, Foucauldian power dynamics in terms of Uganda, Foucault's analysis of power as a passive, uh, you know, as a passive uh, and uh, disciplinary force sheds light on the ruling elite control uh, in terms of mechanism in Uganda. Uh, so, 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 through the regulation of the control of institutions uh, in terms of bodies, in terms of populations, they exercise power not only through coercion but also through the subtle manipulation of norms and ideologies. And, and this is evident in their suppression of, the, of dissent, not so. And in terms of manipulation of democratic processes and control over the military, uh, exemplifying Foucault's conception of power uh, as, 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 as diffuse and omnipresent 
And that is something, again, you cannot take away from this debate of Trump take it there as a philosophical ideology in terms of jurisprudence. Now, if you are to add to that in terms of Marxist, Marxist uh, analysis of class struggle in Uganda, from Marxist perspective, Uganda's predicament can actually be understood as a manifestation of class struggle, yeah? In terms of uh, the perpetuation of uh, the Bijaji hegemony, yeah? Uh, and, and the ruling elite. So representing the Bijaji, uh, ma maintaining their dominance, for example, through control uh, over the means of, uh, of, uh, of production and ideological institutions, yeah? The argument here is that by suppressing dissent, manipulating democratic processes, for example, and also, you know, promoting dynastic succession, uh, they, they actually perpetuate uh, they end up using their own class interests and maintaining their grip on power at the expense of the, of the proletariat, not so. So that's something you must understand again from, uh, from this debate. And these are super important aspects for us to understand. Now, please understand that Uganda's political predicament, uh, as I said, can actually be analyzed through various philosophical lenses, each providing insights into motivations uh, and also consequences of the ruling class actions. So whether through uh, Machiavellian, or pragmatism in terms of, or whether through Hegelian dialectics or Foucauldian power dynamics or Marxist analysis of, of class struggle, these perspectives offer a deeper understanding uh, of the dynamics of power and governance in Uganda. And that is the comprehension that I would like you intellectuals and, 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 and our love people to comprehend so that we cannot behold tomorrow as having said nothing. Also, Edmund Bank said, the only thing necessary for evil triumph is for good men to do what? To do nothing. Let's argue in terms of uh, utilitarian justification. If you argue in terms of utilitarian justification, the ruling elite in Uganda may employ what they call utilitarian reasoning to justify their action, arguing that their policies ultimately serve their greater good or in terms of the greatest number for the people. Not so. So they may argue that maintaining uh, you know, stability or order, even through utilitarian means, is necessary for economic development and progress. Not so. Favor court law, the argument of favor court law. So this argument of utilitarian calculus could actually, you know, rationalize the, 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 you know, the suppression of any dissent or manipulation of democratic processes as necessary sacrifice for the overall being of the nation. And, 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 and uh, <clears throat> that is something, again, that you may also want to comprehend. Not so. You could also argue, if you had to argue in terms of what they call the social contract theory, from a social contract perspective, the ruling elite may actually frame their actions as uh, fulfilling their obligations to govern the best interest of the populace. Not so. And they might argue uh, that the people by, you know, by participating in democratic processes or by passively accepting the status quo have tactically considered their rule, not so. Something to do with Kelvin theory, if you like. They could also be used to justify the concentration of power within the ruling family, as long as perceived to benefit the majority or maintain <coughs> a particular what? <coughs> Social order, excuse me, yeah? We could also add in terms of uh, divine right of kings, yeah? <coughs> now. Why not a uh, mainstream philosophical perspective in terms of contemporary discourse? Uh, the concept of divine right of kings could actually be invoked in Uganda to legitimize a ruling elite authority. Talk about the virtues, not so. And they are, may claim that their position of power is ordained by higher authority and that they are chosen custodians of uh, the nation's destiny, not so. And therefore, this divine mandate could actually serve to justify their actions uh, as uh, beyond reproach, not so. And therefore, immune to challenge or scrutiny from uh, from mere mortals. And that is something that you may want to comprehend as well. The argument of the virtue is not so. Dynasty and the rule of uh, the powers that be, not so. And then you could also add in terms of what they call nihilism and absurdism. Nihilism and absurdism is a more extensive interpretation. The ruling elite action in Uganda could actually be seen as a reflection of the inherent absurdity and meaningless of uh, in terms of existence. So they may actually embrace a, what they call a nihilistic worldview, believing that there is no inherent moral truth or value. So the only existence of power and the pursuit of one's own interest. Yeah. So this existential nihilism could lead them to, you know, pursue power for its own sake, without regard for ethical considerations, for or for the, or any consequences or consequences in terms of their actions. And that is something again you may comprehend from a jurisprudential and philosophical uh, point of view. So we could also argue that a variety of what philosophical perspectives can actually be applied to analyze and interpret the actions of ruling class in terms of the elite of Uganda today. So whether through utilitarianism or social contract theory or divine right of kings or existential nihilism, each perspective offers unique insights into motivations, justification, and consequences of the exercise of power. And that's why I'm trying to argue in terms of uh, this argument of Kaupu Tegede 
philosophical debate. Not so. Now, let me explore some major possible intended results based on, on the issues that I've been raising about, uh, supported by intellectual and philosophical analysis, so that you may comprehend what we're talking about. Let's first argue in terms of a consideration of what they call dynamic power. Yeah? Now, if you're to argue in terms of consideration of dynamic power, the ruling elite actions are actually aimed at consolidating power within the family, you know, family or ruling family for that purpose, ensuring a seemingly transfer of authority from the incumbent president to obviously his son. Not so. And this reflects, as I said, a Machiavellian pursuit of stability and continuity, prioritizing the preservation of ruling elite authority over any democratic ideals. And that is something you must comprehend again from the word go. Now, if you add in terms of suppression of dissent and opposition, then by stifling dissent and manipulating in terms of the sometimes the democratic processes and co-opting uh, what potential challengers, the ruling elite aim to maintain a stronghold on power, and, that, and they have done that wonderfully. Not so, and therefore this reflects what they call the Foucauldian power dynamics, where control is actually exercised not only through coercion but also through the regulation of norms and ideologies, and that is something you must comprehend in terms of the argument that I'm proponing today. That's why the debate is to how take a day philosophical debate. Not so. Now, if you have to argue in terms of the creation of what they call a dynastic legacy, then one can argue and say the ruling elites seek to establish dynastic, uh, what they call dynastic legacy, perpetuating their family's dominance over Uganda's political landscape for generations to come. Yeah? And this aligns with uh, Hengelian's dialectics. Yeah? As they seek recognition and dominance over the populace, shaping Uganda's societal hierarchy in their own favor. Again, I must say that this has also been done very well, not so. So that again makes a stronger point in terms of the argument that I'm proponing in terms of the, uh, the ideology of Trump to get there. Now, if you're to argue in terms of entrenchment of uh, what they call authoritarian rule through the erosion of uh, some of these democratic safeguards and the manipulation of institutions, the, 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 the ruling elite aim to entrench this authoritarian rule, prioritizing control and stability yeah, over democratic principles. Yeah? So this reflects a utilitarian justification when the sacrifice of individual freedoms is actually deemed necessary for the greater good of the nation. And that is something, again, that you may want to understand and comprehend. Yes? Now, <clears throat> you could also talk about what they call the preemption. Preemption of internal opposition. In terms of strategic reappointments, for example, within the military, as I said, in terms of the hierarchy and the marginalized of uh, potential rivals. Uh, who serve to preempt internal opposition to the ruling elite authority. So this reflects uh, a Marxist analysis in terms of class struggle. So as the ruling elite maintain their dominance by suppressing dissent within their own ranks. And that is again something that you must comprehend again from this ideology. So most of the things that I'm discussing uh, give you a, 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 an, inter, a, what, an insight into, into the politics, the, the ideology, the philosophical arguments that are proponing in, in the nation as we understand it today. When you add in terms of the projection of military power, the ruling elite promotion of the president's son, for example, within the military, in spite of the fact that he's super good, no doubt about that, is an avert, political avert in terms of ambition that serves to, pro, you know, to project uh, military power as a tool of political dominance. Not so. And this reflects what they call the uh, Nietzschean or Nietzschean will to power. So as they seek to assert their authority and shape Uganda's political future according to their own vision. And this is something, again, you must comprehend from the ideology of Krakow to get there. Not so. So if you're to continue uh, in terms of uh, comprehending what you're talking about, the intended result of uh, the ruling result actions or class action uh, in Uganda is multifaceted. So encompassing the consolidation of dynastic power, the suppression of dissent, the creation of dynastic legacy, the entrenchment of what they call uh, authoritarian rule, the preemption of uh, internal opposition and the projection of military power. Each of these outcomes is supported, as I said, by intellectual and philosophical analysis. And therefore, by drawing insight from these Machiavelli, Foucault, Hegel, uh, Wilterians in Marxist, and uh, Nashijesan, all create this debate for you without even questioning any further. Yeah? So to assess perhaps the most probable outcome among the provisions or among the, or the options in terms of an analysis, based on the current political landscape of Uganda, I would like to argue uh, the following for you, so that you comprehend some of the things that uh, you may understand. From the argument of Trump today, these are the possible hypothetical uh, outcomes of the challenge that we face today. Number one, there is likely to be a calculated in-house coup uh, by the Sun, yeah? And uh, so while the present Sun has actually been strategically positioned within the military hierarchy, and has actually demonstrated a political ambition, 
orchestrating an in-house coup presents significant challenges. Yeah? And the uh, ruling class have actually taken measures to preempt internal opposition, not so, such as marginalizing potential rivals and consolidating control over key institutions. So additionally, the loyalty of leadership in terms of military to the ruling family may actually mitigate a risk of a coup orchestrated by the president's son, not so. However, if the internal divisions within the ruling elite, for example, were to merge, you know, or if dissatisfaction among the key military leaders uh, were to escalate, the position of an in-house coup cannot be entirely discounted. And that is something that you may comprehend hypothetically in terms of jurisprudence. Number two, if you are to argue in terms of what they call calculated electoral loss by the president to the son, for example, that's another possibility. The prospect, for example, of the president losing an election to his son is, you know, contingent upon several factors, including the credibility and popularity of the son's political movement, yeah? And the integrity of the electoral process, for example, and the willingness of the ruling elite, for example, to relinquish power peacefully. So while the president's son has been actually groomed as a potential successor and has actually garnered significant uh, you know, public attention, the ruling elite have actually demonstrated a willingness to, to, to manipulate perhaps the democratic process in terms of uh, suppression of dissent and also maintaining their grip on power. Yeah? <coughs> Therefore, uh, while an electoral loss by the president uh, to his son is conceivable, it remains uncertain uh, whether the ruling elite could actually accept uh, for example, <clears throat> such an outcome to resort to, uh, you know, measures to invalidate the election result, for example. And that's something, again, that is hypothetical as a debate for you and I to comprehend. Uh, another point which is super important is a further consolidation uh, or another consolidation of the, of the father's rule <clears throat> in using uh, the son's uprising popularity as credible opposition, yeah? Uh, given the ruling elite track record of consolidating power and suppressing dissent, uh, the most probable outcome may actually involve uh, further consolidation of the father's rule, not so, coupled with the uh, utilization of the son's uprising popularity and uh, controlled opposition, not so. So this scenario basically will, uh, can easily align itself with the ruling elite pragmatic approach of governance when they seek to maintain control while projecting an image of political pluralism, not so. And therefore by co-opting, uh, for, co for example, the son's uh, uh, political movement and positioning uh, it becomes a credible opposition of sorts. So the ruling elite can actually uh, deflect criticism and authoritarianism and perpetuate their dominance over Uganda's political landscape. And that is something, again, you cannot take away from the hypothetical possible outcomes in terms of, uh, of this debate of Trump take a day. These are super important aspects in terms of debates. As I said, they don't intend to arouse any kind of, of opposition or any kind of treason of any sort or criminality of any sort, See whether civil or liberal or whatever, it's intended for intellectual argument, uh, for jurisprudence. So while these scenarios are conceivable, the most probable outcome based on the current political dynamic in Uganda is the further consolidation of the father's rule, accompanied by the strategic utilization of the son's uprising popularity as a controlled opposition, yeah? And this scenario basically is grounded in, uh, in the ruling elite pragmatic approach of governance and their demonstrated willingness to perhaps manipulate or democratic processes to maintain power. And that is something, again, that you must comprehend, again, from the word go. Uh, if I'm to develop a little deeper in terms of the factors that can contribute to the likelihood of any suggested outcome, I, I could argue in terms of historical precedent, for example, you could argue and say that the ruling elite in Uganda have a history of employing what they call authoritarian what, uh, tactics to maintain power, yeah? including the suppression of uh, dissent, perhaps manipulation of the, the democratic processes, and even consolidating of control over key institutions. Yeah? So this historical uh, precedent suggests that they are actually unlikely to relinquish power willingly or even may resort to coercive uh, you know, uh, measures to preserve their authority. And that is something, again, we cannot argue away from this ideology of take it there in terms of jurisprudence. Okay. And then you could also argue in terms of control over institutions. Yeah? The ruling elite uh, maintain control over key institutions, including the military, obviously, judiciary, uh, where we are we're arguing that sometimes the judiciary becomes more, what, executive-minded than executive itself. And then you could also, in terms, in terms of electoral commission, where we don't see an independent electoral co uh, commission in spite of, uh, of sound case law to that effect, which enables them to manipulate the political landscape to their advantage. So the control of institutions provide them with means to suppress dissent and mitigate challenges to their authority, increasing the likelihood of a further consolidation of power. And this is super important, again, in terms of understanding this argument of the philosophy of Trump to get there. 
Now, if you urge in terms of uh, resource advantage, the ruling uh, elite possesses significant resources, obviously, and patronage networks, not so, which can actually leverage to maintain their own grip on power. So this resource advantage allows them to co-opt potential challengers, uh, marginalize dissenting voices, for example, and even manipulate, as I said, electoral processes, further consolidating their control over Uganda's political landscape. And we, we cannot take that away from this debate, yeah? And then you could also add in terms of international support, not so, which again is, is crucial in terms of uh, uh, creating uh, what? A semblance of authority. So the ruling elite have actually cultivated alliances with foreign powers and international organizations, which provide them with diplomatic and even financial support, yeah? Notwithstanding the fact that, yeah, but the, the sodomy homosexuality issue may have had its bite, but we all know that it's probably temporal, yeah. So this international uh, backing enhances their legitimacy and enables them to withstand external pressures from democratic reforms or even political change. So bolstering their position and reducing a likelihood of a successful challenge to the authority. And that is something, again, that especially Uganda being that privileged position, politically privileged, in, especially in terms of America, where it stands to, to, uh, to harness uh, some kind of semblance of order among the countries that, the around, that surround Uganda that are used at war. Okay, then you, you could actually in terms of culture and societal factors. Uganda society has actually historically been characterized by, you know, what they call hierarchical structures and, uh, you know, a culture of uh, difference to authority, which may actually mitigate what paid resistance to the ruling elite authoritarian rule. So, <clears throat> additionally, divisions along ethnic, for example, regional and political lines may actually limit the effectiveness of opposition movement and even impede efforts to mobilize popular support for political change. So the, 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 the point I'm underscoring here, my friends, is that in light of these factors, the most probable outcome in Uganda's father, uh, in, in terms of consideration of uh, the father's rule, or is accompanied, <coughs> as I said, by the <coughs> strategic um, utilization of the son's uh, uprising popularity <coughs> as uh, a controlled opposition, yeah? And this scenario is grounded in the ruling elite <coughs> historical tactics, institutional control, uh, resource advantage, international support, societal uh, dynamics, uh, all of which contribute to the ability to maintain power and suppress uh, dissent. And also, you could also argue that another possible conspiracy theory uh, or theory for that purpose that could emerge from the factors outlined could also revolve around the notion of uh, what they call a state political drama orchestrated by the ruling ally to maintain power while creating illusion of democratic transition. Yeah, And uh, this theory possesses that the ruling ally manipulates the political landscape to perpetuate their rule while presenting a facade of political pluralism and competition. And that is something, again, you must understand from this ideology of Trump to get there. Not so. So under the, this conspiracy theory, one could argue and, and comprehend that uh, <coughs> it's important that, uh, that uh, the illusion in terms of uh, opposition, the illusion of opposition, the ruling elite in Guinea, the emergency of the present son as a political challenger, not so, cultivating his public image as uh, a charismatic leader advocating for change. However, uh, uh, behind uh, the scenes, the son remains firmly aligned with the ruling family's interests. Not so. Serving as a, control, a controlled opposition intended to divert attention uh, from authoritarian uh, what, uh, tactics employed by the ruling elite. I've had one gentleman uh, who said, it used to be uh, the gentleman called, uh, uh, I won't mention his name, but he keeps saying that, uh, that what? Basically, they came to close the Yajja Pugala Lujirwa Manju, to use that phrase, yeah? So th those arguments could also be propounded in terms of that aspect. Now, you could also add in terms of manufactured electoral drama. Yeah, the, the ruling elite stage electoral contest between incumbent president and his son, for example, presenting them as genuine contenders of power. Uh, however, the electoral process it becomes perhaps a bridge in favor of the ruling family with the manipulation of uh, <coughs> perhaps voter registration, uh, ballot counting, and intimidation of opposition supporters ensuring a desired outcome, not so. So despite the appearance of competitive elections, uh, the ruling class maintain tight control over the political landscape and allowing them to perpetuate their rule without significant challenge. Please understand, as I said, this is jurisprudence. It's not intended to provoke, insinuate, or cause any criminal libel, whether civil actions against any individual or any kind of what? Of treason or perhaps mistreason of treason. This is jurisprudence, intellectualism, thinking outside the box and throwing the box away. You could also argue in terms of theoretical succession planning. The ruling elite orchestrate a carefully uh, what, choreographed transition of power from the incumbent uh, president to his son. Yeah? 
presenting it as a natural evolution of Uganda's political landscape. However, this succession plan is actually designed to maintain continuity within the ruling family, with the son serving as a puppet ruler perhaps, while the real power remains con in concentrated in the hands of the entrenched ruling elite. And that is something, again, that you cannot take away from this debate of Trakutegete. You could also add in terms of international complicity, yeah? The ruling elite Ghana international support and legitimacy for their orchestrated political drama, presenting Uganda as a beacon of a democratic transition and the stability in the region. So international observers and foreign governments are eager to maintain diplomatic relations and stability in the region, as I told you. Uh, so they therefore turn a blind eye to the manipulation of the democratic processes and even human rights abuses perpetrated perhaps by the ruling class. Not so. And so inadvertently enabling their continued authoritarian rule. And that is something, again, you have to look at as well in terms of uh, a possible uh, dilemma. Yeah? And then you could also add in terms of the illusion of change, as I told you. Through carefully crafted media campaigns and uh, public relations well, strategies, uh, the ruling elite create an illusion of progress and change, yeah? portraying uh, the emergency of the present sun as a sign of political dynamism yeah? in terms of renewal. Yeah? And, uh, however, in reality, there may be little substantive change that may occur as the ruling elite remain in terms of uh, very tight on top of, in terms of the grip of power and continue to prioritize their own interests uh, you know, over the welfare of the Uganda's populace. <clears throat> and that is something, again, you cannot take away from this debate. So the, the idea in terms of the conspiracy theory uh, possesses that the ruling elite in Uganda may or can manipulate the political landscape to perpetuate uh, their rule within creating the illusion of uh, democratic transition and, and what competition. So through uh, the argument of state electoral contest, uh, manufactured opposition, <clears throat> and uh, international complicity, uh, they maintain tight control over the political narrative, yeah? <coughs> in terms of ensuring uh, <coughs> their continued dominance while actually presenting, as I said, a facade of political pluralism and change. And uh, if um, <coughs> to make a further debate in terms of the uh, potential implications and consequences of such a conspiracy uh, in terms of this theoretical aspect, I would argue uh, in terms of number one, if you are to argue as a possible uh, consequence in terms of this conspiracy, you, do, you could argue in terms of maintaining status quo. The primary objective of uh, such a conspiracy theory is to preserve the status quo and populate the ruling, uh, uh, you know, elite grip on power. So by constituting the, the controlled uh, political drama, they effectively manage the transition of power within the ruling family while avoiding uh, the substantive changes to the existing power structure. So <clears throat> definitely this allows them to safeguard their interests and maintain their privileged position within Ugandan society. And that is something that you cannot take away from this debate. And then number two, you could also argue in terms of undermining genuine uh, democratic processes, yeah? And um, the stage day political drama could actually undermine genuine uh, democratic processes and erode public trust uh, in terms of the electoral system, yeah? And therefore, by uh, manipulating, for example, elections and presenting a uh, facade of competition, the ruling elite uh, delegitimize uh, uh, the democratic institutions and reinforce uh, perceptions of uh, authoritarianism. And this could actually lead to disillusionment among the populace and further entrenchment of uh, apathy or cynicism towards political participation. <clears throat> and that's something, again, you cannot uh, argue away. And then in terms of number three, you could also look at it in terms of sidelining what they call a uh, genuine opposition. Yeah, so this manufactured opposition uh, represented by the president's son or whoever uh, serves to marginalize genuine opposition voices and neutralize potential challenges uh, to the ruling uh, elite authority. So by co-opting uh, dissent and challenging it into controlled channels, the ruling uh, elite suppresses dissenting voices uh, uh, and maintain monopoly on, 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 what, on political power. And uh, this basically stifles uh, pluralism and undermines the principles of, of, of democratic governance as we may know it today. So those are super, super important aspects in terms of argument. And so it's important that you comprehend what we're talking about in terms of talk ticket. And then we could also add you as another point in terms of international complicity and legitimate, uh, legitimization, for example, uh, the complicity of international observers and foreign governments in legitimizing uh, the state political drama provides uh, a veneer of legitimacy uh, to the ruling elite authoritarian rule. So by endorsing the electoral process process and uh, downplaying concerns about electoral manipulation, the international community inadvertently legitimizes uh, uh, the ruling uh, elite grip on power 
and undermines the efforts to promote genuine democratic reforms in Uganda. And that is, again, something that you cannot take away from this debate. And then you could also argue in terms of the potential for backlash and unrest. Yeah? Uh, while the ruling elite may actually succeed in maintaining their grip on power in terms of short term, the manipulation of democratic processes <coughs> and uh, suppression of dissent could sow the seeds of discontent and unrest among the populace. So over time, uh, such uh, widespread uh, disillusionment uh, with the political system and uh, grievances over lack of uh, perhaps genuine what, representation could fuel uh, social unrest or resistance uh, movements aimed at challenging the ruling elite uh, authority. And that's something, again, you cannot take away uh, from this debate. And these are super, super important aspects that you need to comprehend even as you, we, we argue uh, this conspiracy. So the argument that we're proponing here, my friends, is that the conspiracy theory basically highlights the, the potential consequences of a state political drama orchestrated by the ruling elite in Uganda. And by manipulating the political landscape, for example, undermining uh, genuine democratic processes and co-opting opposition voices, uh, they seek to perpetuate their grip on power while presenting uh, a facade of political pluralism and change. Uh, however, uh, this strategy, as I said, carries the risk of undermining public trust and also fueling discontent and ultimately leading to unrest or even resistance against the ruling elite authoritarian rule. And these are things that we cannot take away again from this debate <coughs> of trial to take a day. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the argument that I'm proponing in terms of uh, the dispensation here today is that in the labyrinth of uh, political uh, machinations and uh, the interplay of power dynamics, the echoes of Trauma Protected Day uh, reverberate uh, with both promise and peril. So as we traverse the, what, the convoluted terrain of Uganda's political landscape, uh, it is imperative to heed the warning signs that emerge from the depth of our philosophical inquiry. As mm -hmm. I say, this is merely a philosophical inquiry. And uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from, 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 from the argument that I presented here, we could argue that the veneer of uh, orchestrated uh, transitions and manufactured oppositions lies uh, a stack of reality and the erosion of democratic principles. So the stifling of dissent and the consolidation of authoritarian rule and the state political drama cloaked in the guise of electoral uh, competition and pluralistic discourse uh, conceals a darker truth, uh, the subversion of the will of the people and the entrenchment of a dynastic power. And this is something, again, you have to comprehend and take seriously as food for thought, not so. So if unchecked, for example, the unchecked pursuit of power by the ruling elite threatens to unravel the very fabric of Ugandan society, uh, breeding disillusionment, uh, resentment, and the societal uh, you know, unrest, and the manipulation of democratic processes and uh, the suppression of genuine opposition uh, voices sow seeds of discord and undermine the foundations of trust and uh, legitimacy upon which uh, the functioning uh, democracy uh, basically depends, which reminds me of that uh, popular what, drama of, uh, of a guy who used to say, uh, they will ask you, eh, did you learn something? Eh, 30 years of bananas, remember that? By, by, what? by, by well, great, the, the great, uh, the great uh, writer, uh, theater, 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 theatrist, uh, in, uh, there's a drama that used to happen some time ago. So moreover, the complicity of international community in uh, legitimizing authoritarian rule only serves to embolden the ruling elite. So reinforcing their sense uh, of impunity and perpetuating circles of oppression. So in the absence of meaningful uh, accountability and genuine political reform, Uganda risks uh, descending further into uh, what they call the ABC of authoritarianism with grave implications for its uh, future stability and prosperity. So as we confront the specter of talk to get there, and uh, its manifold implications. We must maintain uh, vigilance in terms of our defense of uh, democratic values, uh, fundamental rights, obviously. We must challenge the narratives of manipulation and deception, uh, demanding transparency, accountability, and genuine representation from those who claim to lead us. Not so. And that is something that is extremely important. Uh, for only uh, through collective uh, action and informed discourse and uh, unwavering commitment to the principles of democracy can we actually hope to navigate uh, the treacherous currents of political intrigue and emerge uh, on the shores of a more just and equitable future. So let us heed uh, the winning signs, uh, lest we find ourselves uh, ensnared in the tangled web of authoritarianism 
Uh, so with the echoes of 12 ticket day uh, ring hollow, uh, the promises of liberation remains but a distant dream. And this is something, again, you cannot take away from this debate. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Isaac Christopher Lugogo. Welcome to our voice at two generous lawup.com and lugogo.org. Find our books. God has been gracious to us. We've written about five, uh, about 50 books now running. 50 books now running and they're readily available at lugogo.org. We've written about almost everything in law and we are breaking ground and we have pride ourselves in, in trying to add value to this country. We don't want to be held accountable tomorrow uh, having done nothing. Like we say, the stories have this argument that if nobody is doing something good, be that person that does something good. So let's be that person that does, does that something good in the interest of our nation. Once again, God bless you and thank you. Find our books at lubogo.org and sujenisrola.com. God bless you. Thank you for your attention. The voice of the people is the voice of God. Fox for police, Fox Day. The welfare of the people is supreme. Salus populi, salus suprema. God bless you. I shall take my leave. Thank you, and God bless you. <laughs>